Good morning. I'm so delighted to be here, my friends. I'm here to share excellent and good news. How many of you think that your thoughts can change the world? How many of you think that your intention can measurably change something out there just the way you want it? You know, the power of intention, that sort of thing. For me as a doctor, I've been never part of that conversation. To me, the power of intention is entertainment, something out of Star Trek. I, Nisha Manik, am a medical doctor, an integrative rheumatologist. I did my medical school at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. I trained in rheumatology at Stanford University. Rheumatology is the specialty for immune diseases and arthritis. And my career, most of my career, was at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. So I know that my rational mind, my intellect, is very precious. But inside of me, there was this niggling little voice. There's much more to the human than this bag of bones and tissues and molecules. I sort of knew that. So one day, I read a paper by a giant in the science of intention. And let me tell you this, this title. I have to read this to you. <laughs> Expanding the thermodynamic perspective for materials in an SU2 electromagnetic EM gauge symmetry state, part one a duplex space model, an application to homeopathy. That's right. I didn't understand it either. <laughs> but I knew. I was writing a book chapter for the human biofield, for a medical textbook. And it is my responsibility to look at the science of the human energy systems. And medicine does not really have a structure, a framework, until I ran into Tiller's work. And you know, that paper, it made my palms sweat a little bit. My heart raced, and I thought, ooh, what's this? So I wrote to him. He was a giant in physics at Stanford. He had retired by now to Arizona, and I heard nothing. My intention was strong. I wrote him again, nothing. And then his associate, Walter Dibble, one email, and I hung on to every word. Bill says, read his book, Psychoenergetic Science. I have a copy of my very first book. Beat up. And when I looked at this book, I thought, reads like a lab manual to me. I still didn't understand what Tiller was all about. But I knew he had a message, and I was determined to find it. So I was giving a medical talk in Scottsdale, Arizona. Tiller lives there. And luckily enough, he agreed to meet me for dinner. Now, what would you ask Charles Darwin if you met Charles Darwin for dinner? What would you say to Albert Einstein? For me, meeting Tiller was like meeting a rock star. Because his physics speaks to human evolution. His physics speaks to the power of consciousness. And it surpasses the yardstick that Einstein put, the speed of light. We have to let go of those constructs, my friends. So when I met with Tiller that Scottsdale, you know, that dinner, Four hours was like magic. But here's the real magic. I was trying to show off a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. And I said to him, intention, you know, disciplining yourself. Do you know A Course in Miracles? I was a student of A Course in Miracles. And he says, oh, yeah, you know, Helen Shuckman, the scribe, well, she came to see me in Menlo Park. My jaw went up. I knew I had found my mentor, who, a physicist of his caliber and 
a giant in spirituality comes to meet him in Stanford in the 1970s? Holy shucks! Because you see, in Teller's world, science and spirit are equal. They're complementary pathways to knowledge. Science has protocols. You follow them in the lab, and you get outcomes. Just like that, spirituality has its protocols. You do that, and it has its outcomes. To Tiller's world, they're the same. The logos and the mythos on the same plane. That dinner, when I left that restaurant, I was more determined that this is my mentor, except there was a problem. He wanted nothing to do with me. <laughs> Go back to medicine. That's where you belong. You shouldn't be messing in physics. Three months later, I was really crushed, actually. Three months later, I get the most important phone call from Tiller. I've been thinking, Nisha, if you can communicate a little bit of my work for your colleagues, I think I can work with you because, you see, medicine is stuck in chemistry. But there was a condition, and he said, this is what you need to do if I'm going to work with you. And I was listening, yes. Every day you're going to do meditation, and only then will I work with you. Wow, I was in. <laughs> Folks, let's pause for a moment. Medical school, you know, application forms. Not one time have I been asked, do you meditate daily? One of the most important skill sets in my application at Stanford, there was nothing about meditation, and I knew this is my mentor. In that phone call, he showed me where his priorities are. It's not just about data and physics and accolades and NIH grants. It is about who you are as a human being. I was missing that so much in medicine. So I went to my chairman the next morning at Mayo, and Eric looked at me and he says, I've lost you. I hate to lose you, but you're following your nose. You're following your intention. I can't stop you, but keep in touch with us. Godspeed. So in the dead of winter, I packed up my apartment in Rochester, Minnesota, got into my Jeep, and while an ice storm is chasing me down, I drive past the sleeping towns of Austin, Albert Lee, Iowa, and I was racing towards Arizona. My family thought I was gone off the rails. They thought I was off to Machu Picchu for all they cared. They really were very confused and worried about me. I had no funding. I didn't know what I was getting into, no curriculum. I left everything I knew behind, prestige. I left it all because I was in the pursuit of truth. I needed to know what Tiller has, and he had a secret I wanted to find out. And so here I am in Scottsdale, empty apartment, airbed for my mattress, a collection of physics books, and I got to work. Every Thursday, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., Tiller and me would meet. I got a couch, a rental couch, so you could sit down somewhere, you know, you eminent physicist. Two hours, we'd have our conversation. And I drew the curriculum, my questions. And I would hold a flip camera, I'd put it on the stack of physics books, and I recorded everything. Because any time Tiller said something, it was wrapped with lots of concepts. And I had to unravel those and learn and make it my own and bring my voice to it. That was the mentor, the teacher, the guru I needed. Tiller did something very interesting in his target experiments. And in fact, his work is the inspiration behind Lynn McTaggart and many others. It's Tiller. Look behind. And Tiller did this. He said, how can you measure the effects of your intention in a physics lab? To him, your intention is just as real as a chemical reaction or a crystal growing in its solution, just as real. But in my worldview, consciousness is the brain. You do brain MRIs, but there's no brain MRI here. Just imagine what he was doing 
at Stanford University, and he showed it. He showed with target experiments. The first experiment, he asked himself, can my intention change the pH of water? How could you do that, and how would you measure it? This was the first target experiment. When I read those results, I said, no way, Jose, can you do this? Because water is medicine. Water is us. Water is essential for life. Because if he can do that with no chemical additions, then the game is up. Now, he also did intention experiments to change enzyme effects. Then he went a step further to change whole living systems. There was a piece of the puzzle. Because we all intend, how come our effects, my intentions like, like you know, poopy effects, like, oh, I'm intending and intending. And, and one piece of the puzzle was in the data. And so fantastic it was because it made total sense to me. It sort of started to line up. And that is the subject of my book, Bridging Science and Spirit, which was released yesterday. I want you to get this book. It's very important and great ideas. But I'm getting a little ahead of the story. Because I'm a physician, and I said I bring good news. Tiller did something that was really like science fiction, except it isn't. And I share that data in my book. There's a medical epidemic that's happening around the world. It's not just the United States, and that's the epidemic of loneliness. People feel disconnected. So Tiller did something very interesting. He is in Arizona, and he hooked up with a psychologist in Silicon Valley, Dr. Hilberg. And what Tiller did was make an intention which he imprinted into a device. This is his genius. You see Princeton, Stanford University, lots of great universities have shown unequivocally human intention affects machines without physical touch. You can do this with your mind. Go try it at the slot machine. <laughs> you can do these things with your mind and more. So Tiller said, okay. He took it a step further and imprinted his intention to help people with loneliness. And in this little experiment, he switched on the device in Arizona. People are in San Francisco. No connection to Tiller. And you can guess what happened. The p-values less than 0.0001. These kinds of results happen less than 1 in 10,000 chance, okay? It was so statistically significant. I was blown away. Imagine a healing information, no doctor visits, no waiting room, no side effects, no medications. I thought, oh my God, what could I do with fibromyalgia? What could I do with rheumatoid arthritis? How could we augment even our medicines with our intention, with Tiller helping? To me, it blew out everything I ever knew. But Tiller's sign speaks to something even deeper, and that is the good news. Because Tiller's sign speaks to one of my other teachers, and he said, Homo sapiens are evolving. We are evolving from Homo sapiens to Homo spiritus. We are spiritual beings. And if Tiller can, with his intention, change materials in his lab, can help people hundreds and thousands of miles away and not know them, what can we do? What can you do? What can you do? What can I do? It is my responsibility to clear up my crap. This was the reason for meditation. I cannot work with you, Nisha, until you meditate, until you get your muddled mind out of the way, and you can see with clarity in front of you what it really means. Give meaning to this. Give meaning to your unconscious. Give meaning to your conscious. Understand your mind. 
So my challenge to you is this. One, buy or pick up your book, Bridging Science and Spirit, and I give you a challenge. Pick up meditation. Become that intender, because intention is your natural resource that will never run out. That will never run out. Thank you so much.